Bridgeton has the largest historic district in the state of New Jersey. It includes an amazing number of individual architectural gems, many designed by noted architects. With more than 2,000 properties, it has six sub-districts. The Commercial District, the Courthouse District, the East Lake District, the Glenview District, and the Northgate, Parkview, and Southgate Districts. The character of the overall district is defined by well-crafted and largely residential structures and a variety of common American styles. Originally built as homes to the middle and working class families of the city's industrial boom period. But what is a historic district anyway? A historic district is a group of buildings, properties, or sites that have been designated as historically or architecturally significant. Such sites can have local or even world significance, and they are everywhere. There are historic districts all over the world celebrating and telling the stories of their people and creating cultural and learning experiences we can get in no other way. We call this heritage tourism, and they can be lively, welcoming, and exciting places. Only the Bridgeton District can tell the unique story of Bridgeton, but we have others close by, as in the beautiful historic districts of Cape May and Ocean Grove, with structures of a similar time period to Bridgeton. In the United States, a historic district designated at the national level is included in the National Register of Historic Places. This is a great honor, and Bridgeton's district has this honor. By itself, it does not mean the district has much protection. And while it may offer some protection at the state level, only designations at the local level offer by far the most legal protection for the properties within its limits. This means that the buildings and their settings are protected by local laws and public review by a local historic commission and commissioners. Well, but what are these buildings or sites being protected against? against the loss of integrity. And integrity means the ability of a place or structure to tell its story and to go on telling it into the future. Normally, for a district, this means the outside or exterior of a building or structure, what we see from the street. Loss of integrity happens rail by rail, window by window, porch by porch, we can lose a building, a block, a street, and then we have also lost the bragging rights for having a district and all its benefits. Benefits? Really? So what are the benefits of a historic district and of having one in Bridgeton? Again, the National Park Service helps explain. Well-kept historic districts are often the safest and most stable parts of the city. They protect an owner's financial and personal investment in a home. Real estate agents may use historic district status as a marketing tool to sell properties. Local districts can encourage better design of new buildings. They also help the environment. They encourage us not to destroy what is already here and toss it into a landfill. Districts educate people. They tell important stories about us and those who were here before us. A local district can have proven benefit for the local economy, encouraging creative businesses and tourism. Historic district status can encourage good new businesses to come to Bristol and to stay here. Many people describe the positive social and psychological benefits of living in a historic district. They connect us to the past and to one another. They help create community. So, we know what we have and maybe we know why we should protect it. But how does this actually work here in Bridgeton? Well, in Bridgeton, we have a local law adopted in 1984 that sets out a process not just to prevent owners from doing what is wrong, but to encourage them to do what is right. People who know Bridgeton history and architecture review work on properties within the district and try to discourage alterations like these. And this, which not only destroys character, but also has a terrible negative impact on property values and on the way we see and experience the city. 
So, if your property is located within the limits of the historic district and you are planning exterior work on your building, you need to start at the zoning office by applying for a certificate of appropriateness. This is the law. Any exterior work on any building within the district undertaken without a certificate of appropriateness is actually subject to fines. The process goes like this. You submit your application to the zoning department and the administration officer classifies it as a minor or major application. If it's a minor application and all needed information is complete, the officer can approve or adjust it immediately and let you do the work. If it is judged to be a major application, you will need to appear before the Historic District Commission when it meets. They will strive to help you find a solution that is correct. This is the application for a certificate of appropriateness that you need to fill out. Work that requires a certificate of appropriateness includes demolition or any new construction and relocation or removal of any building or structure on the property. In fact, any visible changes to the exterior appearance of a building, even painting or repainting that drastically changes its outside color profile. A certificate of appropriateness is not required for exact replacement in kind or for routine or ordinary maintenance and repair. But how do you know what is appropriate? The district officer can tell you, but answers can also be found in the design guidelines for the historic district, available on the city website and in printed format from the zoning office. Here in Bridgeton, they are available in English and Spanish. These guidelines explain and recommend. They guide officials and residents alike. They should be the basis of every decision. The guidelines cover new construction and removal. But let's concentrate here on rehabilitation and maintenance that raise the most common questions. And let's look at examples of appropriate and inappropriate treatments on exterior walls, roofs, windows, trim, and entrances and porches. Okay, exteriors. Original exterior walls and siding materials should be retained and repaired, not replaced. If an exterior wall is too deteriorated to repair, the goal should be to replace it with material the same or similar to the original. This double house shows a retained and repaired original siding on the left, and on the right, an inappropriate replacement of the siding. Do not resurface original materials with inappropriate new materials such as artificial stone or artificial brick veneer. When removing deteriorated paint from wood siding, avoid destructive methods such as sandblasting and water blasting. And don't use sandblasting or high pressure water blasting even to clean masonry walls. This erodes the surface of the stone or brick and speeds deterioration. Repoint masonry walls when there is evidence of disintegrating mortar, cracks in mortar joints, loose bricks, or moisture retention in the walls. Match the old mortar. Retain corner boards. Don't cover fish scales. They are the scalloped ornamentation that appears on many Bridgeton homes. The same with the horizontal boards called belt courses. Don't remove or cover them. And save the brackets on porches and on roof cornices. These and all the other features we've mentioned are distinctive to Bridgeton Victorian homes. Do clean and repaint them or, if necessary, replace them exactly like the originals. Remember, built-in gutters require periodic cleaning and maintenance. Water may leak into eaves and be held there and damage may go unnoticed for a long time. These gutters and cornice ornaments give our buildings special character. Look at your roof and its shape and functional and decorative features. Remember, roofing materials and silhouette are also very important elements in a building's historical look and feel. Do strive to keep the original shape, pitch, and configuration of the roof whenever possible. In fact, unless it is very deteriorated, try to keep the original roofing. Partial re-roofing should match up new roof coverings with older ones. Yes, complete roof replacement may use new materials, but they should be compatible substitutes for original materials and try to replicate original look and character. 
Windows lend great character to a building. They are a key indicator of architectural style and age. Careless remodeling or replacement can be a disaster for both visual appeal and historic integrity. Retain the number, size, and locations of existing window openings. Don't block in windows to reduce the size of the opening or to fit stock window sizes. And don't add new window openings where they can be seen from the street. These are often the central focus of historic buildings. The porch, and often the double porch, is an especially distinctive feature of a Britain district home. Each house style has a particular type of entryway which directly relates to the overall building design. You should try to retain the original features of entrances and porches whenever possible. And do salvage historic materials. Don't discard elements if they can be repaired and reused. Don't enclose an open front porch with opaque walls or materials. Well-proportioned, screened, or glassed-in porches can be designed so they will not destroy one of the key facial features of a historic house. Finally, trim. This refers to any special ornamental details applied to a building. Such ornamentation is often a key part of a building's historic period and style and exhibits a skilled craftsmanship not available today. Try to retain and repair such trim elements rather than replace them. Let's work together. Remember, those who came before us worked hard to try to make life more beautiful for themselves and for us. They have passed on that beauty if we are willing to hold on and protect it. Let's keep our bragging rights. Let's make our largest historic district a place to enjoy life, continue telling our story, craft our future, and make history. Chaba is here to help.